Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Carrie Murphy. I'm the team leader of the Diesel Engine Exhaust Brake Project, or team number 17. Uh, my teammates are Preston Dudley, Charles Schindler, Craig Ricks, and James Center. Our project sponsor, again, is the United States Army Materials System Analysis Activity, or DUSAMSAA. Um, our project coordinator with the Army is Brian Primer. Our faculty advisor is Dr. Cargill, and our senior project coordinator is Professor Marcus. Um, today we're going to tell you about our project. Uh, we're going to go over an introduction, some project management aspects, the testing that we did, our analysis, and of course our final design. And now I'm going to hand it over to Preston to give you our introduction. Okay, so what is a diesel engine exhaust? It's a supplementary braking system to the primary braking system on a vehicle. When a driver lets his or her foot off of an accelerator, the air compressor is actuated here, turning this butterfly valve, shutting off the flow of exhaust. This creates a back pressure on the engine, essentially causing the engine to work in reverse, slowing down the vehicle. <coughs> now, why is this important? Well, primarily, uh, the addition of a supplementary braking system reduces the repair cost on the primary braking system. And secondly, it increases the safety of the vehicle. If you were to consider a vehicle in a very mountainous area with a long descent, the primary braking system would be engaged for a very long period of time. This would increase uh, the amount of wear and tear on the primary braking system. It could lead to a friction fire due to the long-term engagement, and it could lead to a brake failure. So the addition of an exhaust brake to help with the braking uh, increases the safety. Some background on our project. Our project, as Kerry stated, was in conjunction with the ASMSA, AMSAA, and they noticed that the exhaust brake in many of their vehicles was failing. Uh, by failure, I mean that the shaft on which the butterfly valve rotates was seizing within the housing. We'll get uh, to some specifics later. But they noticed that it was failing only after <coughs> 10,000 miles when it had an expected lifetime time to match that of the engine, which would be half a million to a million miles. They did their own investigation to see what the primary cause of failure was and found it to be galvanic impeding corrosion. In a nutshell, galvanic corrosion is uh, when two dissimilar metals with a large electropotential difference are um, in contact and this creates a flow of ions between an anode and a cathode, causing corrosion. Pitting corrosion is nothing more than an isolated form of galvanic corrosion, uh, where a small pit is formed at an anode. Uh, we were also given background on the operating conditions that these exhaust brakes would be subjected to. Uh, because they are used in military applications, they would see a large range in environments and weather. Because of this, it will see ambient temperatures from minus 50 degrees to 126 degrees Fahrenheit. The operating temperature of the exhaust brake itself is that that exceeds 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, making this a major design consideration. Uh, what's something that's unique with uh, the fact that it's in Army use is the fact that these vehicles will constantly be crossing streams and rivers. This means that the exhaust brake will be at its operating temperature and then, then be instantaneously submerged into a much cooler body of water. This then creates a temperature shock, making things such as thermal expansion another very major design consideration. I'm now going to hand it back to Kerry to talk about the goals and the schedule of our project. Okay, so obviously with the background information given, our major design goal was to fix the current problems that were causing failure. Um, obviously we wanted to last with the engine, uh, the life expectancy of the engine for a million miles. Um, it needed to meet all military standards, they have a lot of them, and withstand the operating conditions that Preston had mentioned. It obviously needed to be cost effective. If it was very expensive, we would just need to justify in our design that you know it's worth the, the cost spent. Um, and these vehicles, they're used on several different vehicles in the military, and some of these vehicles had lots of body armor over them, so it was very important that we kept the overall size so that they were easily implemented into the vehicle. For our schedule, um, in the meet, well, I'll explain. There's two different lines. The blue, dark blue line was our proposed schedule, and the lighter blue line was our actual schedule. In the beginning, things were going according to plan. Um, but we quickly realized there was a lot more research that needed to be done, um, especially since we're mechanical engineers and there was a lot of corrosion, so we didn't exactly spend a lot of time on that in our classes. Um, and we also learned that research is an ongoing process with this um, project. Um, some other things that I want to point out that look kind of scary from this end um, are testing and evaluation phase. When we originally proposed this, this um, project and schedule, we were thinking about doing some kind of material testing, but we figured that it would be more efficient to do a corrosion test. Um, so that's why there's such difference. They were completely different tested, testing. Um, most groups had a manufacturing part of their schedule, but for budgetary reasons, for us to make a prototype, it was not exactly feasible. So that's why that's eliminated. Uh, the rest of our schedule, we completed on time, and we will be on time with our reports. So now I'm going to hand it back 
go over to Charles to talk to you about our research and design. As Preston mentioned earlier, we were given information from the AMSAA, which stated that the major cause of failure was galvanic and pinion corrosion. However, we also knew that the high temperature exhaust gases, which flew, flowed through the brake, could also be high in several different toxins due to low grade fuel that the engines could potentially be running on. So we began our research by finding what causes this corrosion and also how to avoid it. We then began looking into materials that would not only remain operable in this highly corrosive environment, but also remain operable in the operating conditions that Preston mentioned earlier. The materials also needed to be easily manufactured and also cost effective. The materials we chose were stainless steels 304, 309, 316L, A286, 410, and titanium. We knew that our major design change to the exhaust brake would be a material change. However, we did not know at this point if we would change the material of the entire housing or simply implement a bushing into the already existing housing. We also considered limit, reducing the shaft diameter, changing the return spring, and also changing the air compressor. All of these had the goal of increasing the shear stress on the shaft, which would break away any corrosion that could potentially build up. We also considered changing the bracket material, which would limit any possibilities of galvanic corrosion. Once we had procured all of our samples, we decided to perform a corrosion test. The, all of the materials were placed in bottles, which were then placed into a salt bath for 16 days. All of the materials had holes drilled into them, and a black oxide coated stainless steel pin was then placed through this hole. This was to best simulate what the exhaust brake would go through in a highly corrosive environment. I'll now pass it on to Craig to talk about our testing results. <clears throat> so as you see, the picture on the top left uh, shows our uh, corrosion test setup after testing. Uh, the tank in the back, the pump, and the heated water, and in front are the uh, bottles containing two samples of our materials uh, secured together by the shaft um, and zip ties. You see at the bottom here is a sh uh, shaft after um, testing by one of the um, worst performing materials. And as you can see in the middle here, there's a heavy amount of corrosion uh, where the material used to be after just 16 days of testing. Um, and the picture in the top right uh, is a sample of our control, uh, which was taken directly off of the housing itself from the original design. And as you can see, it's uh, extremely corroded. Uh, there were some discrepancies in our testing. Uh, first off, we did an immersion test, which basically means that we completely submerged our uh, testing materials underwater uh, as opposed to a salt spray. Uh, tests uh, and the effects of this are that <clears throat> uh, there could have been a lack of oxygen supply to the materials in the bottles uh, which could have um, affected the results of corrosion uh, during testing. Also uh, there was a discrepancy in the material size. Uh, for example the A286 shown here at the top right uh, was uh, purchased uh, with a thickness of about 0.04 inches so uh, 12 one by one inch by one inch pieces had to be stacked on top of each other to uh, require the 0.5 inch thickness on the shaft. Uh, and that's compared to the 309, for example, uh, located at the bottom, in the bottom right picture, uh, where there were only two um, quarter inch pieces stacked on top of each other. Uh, also, reasons for seizure, uh, there was, was a discrepancy. Um, there were two samples of each, um, so you would think that <coughs> it would be uh, just as difficult to twi uh, twist the shaft within for each material. Uh, however, this was not the case. Um, also for our performance, uh, going through evaluating uh, the performance of each material um, based off of not only visible corrosion, but how difficult it was to rotate the shaft in the material. Uh, located, the pictures to the right uh, of stainless steel 410, which performed uh, the best. Uh, as you can see, compared to the previous slide, sorry, the previous two slides here, uh, the shaft uh, located in the middle where the material used to be, there's not nearly as much corrosion. Um, Corrosion that's located here on the ends is mostly due to uh, sitting in the water. Uh, and then the least, the worst performing material um, that was a possible candidate to replace uh, the original was stainless steel 309. And as we predicted, the control um, performed the worst. This is our budget. We were allocated a total of $300, 100 of which uh, we spent on our poster, and most of the remainder we spent uh, strictly for our corrosion testing. At this time, I'd like to pass it over to Jim to start the shaft analysis and final results. Thank you, Craig. Um, for the stress analysis of our exhaust brake, we concluded that the most critical component of our system was the shaft. And we looked at two different scenarios for the shaft evaluation. 
in order to determine whether or not a decrease in diameter was justified. Firstly, we looked at the, when the shaft is in bending from the engine back pressure. And the second scenario is when the shaft is in torsion and bending when the shaft is seized. And the reasons for changing the shaft diameter were to allow for the potential use of a bushing, a overall reduction in the corrosive surface area, and to increase the shear stress in the advent of shaft seizure. Firstly, we have the first scenario's free body diagram. We have a uniformly distributed load applied to the shaft from the back pressure. The reaction forces RA and RB come from the cast iron housing. Now, the most critical point of stress is at the center of the shaft. However, um, due to the stress concentrations at point C and D, we ruled that these points were more um, suitable for evaluation. <clears throat> For the second scenario, we have when the shaft is seized, we have the torque applied and the bending applied from the force of the piston when the shaft is seized, and reactions RA and RB, again, from the cast iron housing. And this time, the stresses and stress concentrations ruled point C to be the point of critical examination. So for both scenarios, we chose to evaluate the cases at point C, and the factor of safety for the back pressure scenario was ruled to be 4.54. And the factor of safety for the seizure scenario is 2.22. These factor of safeties might appear to be low. However, the ultimate strength of the 1018 steel used in the shaft at the operating temperature of 1100 degrees Fahrenheit is reduced by a factor of two. Now, with the smaller diameter, there's a change in the moment of inertia, and there's also an increase in shear stress. So for the safety factor of the back pressure scenario, with the reduced diameter is 3.36. <coughs> and the factor of safety for the C scenario is now 2.11. These factor of safeties are well within acceptable ranges, and therefore the reduction in shaft diameter is justified. In conclusion, our final design came with a combination of solutions. Firstly, we selected our best performing material in the corrosion test, stainless steel 410. Uh, based upon its performance in the test and its mechanical properties such as coefficient of thermal expansion. And uh, we went with the bushing rather than changing the entire housing due to cost and ease of manufacturability and also it would be easier to implement into the current production process. And by choosing the bushing, we were also able to reduce the shaft diameter which would increase the shear stress and reduce the overall corrosive surface area minimizing the possibility of shaft seizure during operation. At this point, I'd like to say a special thanks to Rich and the Machine Shop, the Burring House for sandblasting our exhaust brake, and Quality Tool for allowing us to use our electric grinder. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your time and attentiveness, and I'd like to open up the floor for questions. possibly test the entire length of the new endurance life with our given time constraints. So with our final design, we would uh, run a full scale test of corrosion in order to determine the maximum endurance for that. Uh, we're also in the process of doing some FEA analysis on it to see any more stresses that um, would contribute to premature failure. Yes, Was there any consideration of a different material other than steel? Absolutely. We did look into different ferrochromes and some other uh, higher end materials. The only problem is due to our budget and um, the cost of those materials and they're, they're kind of like unobtainium. So we thought that it would be better just to, to look into the stainless steel for now. Sir in the back. Did you look at different uh, surface hardening or coatings for this shaft? Well, the manufacturer of the brake, actually, one of their solutions, they were also working on the project at the same time. They used a coating, but we went with a different option to differentiate ourselves from them. They used a nitride coating on theirs? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, you chose the your best performing um, corrosion material, the 410. 
Did you look at any cost differences between using that material and using, say, your second best performing uh, corrosion material? Um, another key factor that made us want to use the 410 was the fact that it's also a common bushing material. So to you know make it easier, we would try to keep the standardized size and stuff for easier manufacturing processes. Thanks. Yes, Did you use the standard test method for the corrosion Yes, uh, we looked up the ASME standard for immersion testing and bait, and it's kind of specific to our project, but it's based off of that. Uh, we went through and followed the steps that that, that um, standard outlined and based it personally off of ours. Good time for one more question. Thank you very much, Dean.